All right, good morning, everybody. I want to begin my talk by discussing the reaction on social media to the Instant Transactions Workshop. Because <laughs> I, th I think it's both uh, interesting and, and, and insightful. So there was one group of people from the Bitcoin Cash community who thought having this workshop was a waste of time. They thought it was a waste of time because in their mind, Bitcoin Cash Instant Transactions already worked really well, so why do you need a workshop to try to improve something that's already fantastic? At the same time, there was another group of people from the BTC core side who also thought this workshop was a waste of time, but they thought it was a waste of time for a completely different reason. You see, in their minds, they think that the idea of instant Bitcoin transactions is fundamentally broken. So why do you want to have a workshop trying to improve something that they believe can never work in the first place? So I thought that dichotomy was really interesting and I guess I kind of think about it that maybe there's these two mental models out there. I call it the wallet-centric model and the blockchain-centric model. The wallet-centric model is basically, if it's in your wallet and you can see it and you can spend it, then it's, it's your money and it's secure. Simple as that. Blockchain-centric model, if it's not in the blockchain, it's not your money and it's not secure. Now, obviously, this is a, a gross simplification that sort of makes a, a caricature of those, of those two groups. but I. I think there's a, a little bit of truth in that as well. Anyways, the title of my talk is Empirical Double Spend Probabilities for Unconfirmed Transactions. To the people in this room, I want to communicate some of the simple experiments I did to try to measure how likely it was for a determined attacker to succeed in a double spend attack against someone who accepted payment with an instant Bitcoin transaction. And to people from the broader community who might be watching a video of this talk, I want to help you build a more realistic or a more nuanced mental model of instant Bitcoin transactions. Okay, so let's begin by answering the question, what is a double spend? I see three definitions thrown around. The first is when the same coin is spent in two different but economically meaningful transactions. The second is when the same coin is spent in two different transactions and both were confirmed on the blockchain. And the third, when two transactions spending the same coin are broadcast to the Bitcoin network, and the one broadcast second confirms instead of the one broadcast first. I think definition number two here is a, is a bad definition, at least in the context of Bitcoin, because Satoshi's proof of work innovation basically makes it impossible for the same output to be confirmed in two different transactions. The miners without their blocks orphaned. So definition number two is, is not very useful because it just can't happen in Bitcoin if 50% of the hash power is honest. I think definition three appeals to a lot of uh, the more technically minded mathematical folk uh, because they think there's something special about the, the first transaction this broadcast. And if the second transaction confirms, then this is some failure of the network. But I think that's a, a bad definition too, because as we'll see later in my talk, it's often the second broadcast transaction that's actually the legitimate transaction that in an ideal world you would want to confirm to prevent the merchant from being defrauded. So that leaves definition one. I, I think this is the best definition. And an example of this would be some person going into a, a coffee shop, buying a coffee with a Bitcoin transaction, taking the coffee, and then later crafting this double spend transaction to reverse the money back into their own wallet. Um, so it's economically meaningful because there was a victim in this attack. I, I think any, definition, any good definition of double spend has to have the notion that somebody is being defrauded here. In this case, it's the merchant who gave you the coffee but didn't end up getting paid. Okay, what is an unconfirmed transaction? Everybody knows that in Bitcoin, there's a bunch of transactions put into blocks. Transactions, once they're inside blocks, those are confirmed transactions. We know that blocks are built on top of other blocks. And if you follow that chain of block all the way back, you get to the Genesis block, mined by Satoshi on January 3rd, 2009. This big chain of blocks is, of course, called the blockchain. And the blockchain is always growing. And the way it's growing is because there's people all over the world making 
transactions. They're, they're buying goods, they're sending money to exchanges, and they're broadcasting those transactions into the network. There are miners around the world that are collecting those transactions and trying to find a proof of work solution to allow them to commit this new subset of transactions onto the blockchain in the form of a new block. So what is an unconfirmed transaction? It's just one of these transactions here. It's a transaction that's valid, but that has not yet been confirmed in a block by a miner. Okay, so is accepting unconfirmed transactions safe? Opinions vary on this question. This is Peter Todd in 2013 saying, like it or not, a zero comp is dangerous when you don't trust the other party. The same thread on, on Bitcoin Talk, Jeff Garzik responds, it is proven that unconfirmed transactions are not safe today. <clears throat> Earlier this year, Craig Wright kind of said the exact opposite. He said only miners or collusion therewith can successfully double spend unconfirmed transactions. And this is at a cost of $68,000 a day and growing. So he's basically saying, no, interest transactions are, are really, really secure. And then finally, we get to uh, Justice Ranbeer's comment here. And I think he's the only one who, who's really understanding the nuance behind unconfirmed transactions. He says, security in this context is being inappropriately treated like a binary concept. Accepting zero comp transactions is an issue of risk management and business planning, not a case of secure versus insecure. <laughs> Good, I, I see you, you guys like that? Okay, so, so I, I think there's so much controversy around the answer to that question, just because it's a really bad question. A much better question is, what is the probability that someone can defraud me if I choose to accept payment with an unconfirmed Bitcoin transaction? Okay, so I ran three simple experiments to help me answer this question. And these, I basically tried to simulate the three attacks that Andrea mentioned earlier in his talk. Okay, so let's look at experiment number one, the fast respend attack. Okay. So all of my attacks is gonna be in the context of some black hat purchasing coffee from a barista in real life. But the attack, you know, it works from a vending machine that was the original example by Satoshi Nakamoto or for buying goods online. Basically, it applies whenever you're uh, buying something and you're receiving that something before the transaction is confirmed. So step number one is to pay the barista. Step number two is to accept the coffee. And step number three is to sign the transaction spending the same coins back to your own wallet and quickly broadcast to your simple nodes that you strategically placed all across the globe. Very easy to do, of course. <laughs> okay, so, so how does this look from the miners' perspective? So when our black hat friend comes in, he broadcasts that, that green transaction to pay the merchant maybe the miner at the top, he sees that transaction pretty quickly, so he starts working on a block candidate with it in it. <coughs> when our black hat broadcasts the red double spend transaction because he, you know, he has these civil nodes placed strategically all across the network, maybe he's able to get the red transaction to race the green transaction and actually beat the green transaction to these three miners. So <coughs> in this case here, we have three miners who think they saw the red transaction first, one miner who, who, who saw, saw the, or did see the red transaction first, one miner who saw the green transaction first, and, 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 and that's, that's the issue here. So it's really a race between the red transaction and the green transaction, and it's important to think about it like that because the miner has to choose. He can't confirm both transactions or he'll have his block orphan. He has to pick red or green, and like Andrea said, they are supposed to pick the transaction that they saw first. Okay, so this is my experimental setup. It consisted of eight test nodes, uh, four Bitcoin Unlimited nodes, and four ABC nodes that uh, Andrea very graciously uh, uh, set up for me, so thank, thank you for that. We had nodes in San Francisco, Toronto, New York, London, Amsterdam, Frankfurt, Bangalore, and Singapore. And all of the clocks on all the nodes were synchronized via the network time protocol. And that's important because time is very much of the essence when you're trying to study the fast respend attack. 
So how did I, I run this experiment? Well, I basically simulated a bunch of double spends from a, like a fictitious merchant. So let's imagine that this node here in Amsterdam is my fictitious merchant. So if I just submit the transaction normally to the, the merchant's node, it's gonna propagate out across the network and when the mine, miners find the next block, the legitimate, the legitimate green transaction is going to be confirmed. But when I am simulating an attack, what we're doing is the black hat pays the merchant in Amsterdam, and then he waits a time delta t, and after delta t seconds, he broadcasts a conflicting double spend from, his, from the other nodes that aren't acting as, as the merchant, so the other seven nodes. And if he's fast enough, we can get this race condition where both the red and the green transaction are racing out across the network, and now there's a chance that the red transaction confirms instead of the green transaction, and the double spend succeeds. Okay, so what did the data look like for this experiment? Well, if the attacker waited or was forced to wait between zero and 50 milliseconds, of the 274 attempts I made, the attacker succeeded 242 times, or 88% of the time. And that makes a lot of sense because that's not a very, very, very long wait. So basically, both transactions are broadcast at about the same time. But of course, the legitimate transaction is only broadcast to one node, where the bogus transaction is broadcast to seven different nodes. So that, that, that's, that's why it's above 50% there. Was this mainnet, Peter, or mainnet? This is mainnet, mainnet BCH. Okay, we can start building up a, we can start building up a graph to uh, visualize this data by plotting the time delay for sending the fraud transaction on the horizontal axis and the probability that the attack succeeds on the vertical axis. So this data point here becomes this red bar. So a lag of zero to 50 milliseconds gave, in my experiment, an 88% success rate. If the attacker is forced to wait a bit longer, 50 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds, the success rate fell to 75%. 100 milliseconds to 150 milliseconds, the success rate fell to 69%. So I made 4,220 attempts in total of this attack. 1,243 succeeded, and I build up this graph here. Um, and as you can see, if the fraudster is forced to, to wait even a second, his chance of success fell below 3%, at least, for, at least for my experiment. So I was pretty excited about this. I, I, I actually made measurements all the way out to 20 seconds, because I thought once in a while, even a transaction broadcast like 15 seconds later might confirm instead, but I didn't get any confirmations beyond three seconds. So, so I was pretty, 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 pretty happy about that. And I know some of the, uh, a lot of the Bitcoin Cash developers have been improving the transaction relay between nodes, uh, so I think this is testament to the fact that you know you guys have done a good job, and I believe if I repeated this experiment on the Bitcoin Core network, it would take a significantly longer time for an unconfirmed Bitcoin Core transaction to have the same level of security as an unconfirmed BCH transaction. Was there a question? So I had a quick question, and this assumes that the attacker is the one actually broadcasting the transaction, uh, most likely from a mobile device. So they're the ones controlling all of it. It's not a case where the merchant broadcasts for the attacker, yep. where they have higher bandwidth than the mobile phone of the attacker, which would lower these numbers substantially. Oh, oh definitely. This is like a, a, a sophisticated attacker with like these special nodes all over the globe. Okay. So this is, a, this is a pretty powerful attack. So we need to assume that this is a sophisticated attacker, right? Because this attack can be packaged in a very simple uh, mm -hmm. form factor. Mm -hmm. Someone is going to make a wallet that does that. Yeah, and have a network. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. So your definition of failure and success is the transaction that enters the block. Now, does the miner discover the respend? Yeah, so I'm just basically, it's, it's considered a double spend success if the if the, if the fraudulent transaction was confirmed instead of the legitimate transaction. That, that's the only thing I'm looking at here. Uh, okay, so I was pretty happy with that. Uh, the one proviso is all this data is based on like normal, small, fast propagating transactions. Uh, and I say small, I mean small in terms of bite size. 
I notice that if I propagate transactions that are like 50 kilobytes or 100 kilobytes with hundreds or thousands of inputs or outputs, those transactions propagate much more slowly. So I think a sophisticated attacker could, could do better this by kind of gaining it, by delivering the merchant, paying him with like a really big 100 kilobyte transaction, and then I think he'd have more time for his fast double spend uh, to, to race. I'm not too worried about that, A, because if I got paid with a 100 kilobyte spam transaction, it looks pretty funny, and B, that costs them a lot of fees to even, even have that transaction confirmed. So there's a natural deterrent to that. Yes? Was there a fee no, the next experiment does have a fee differential. This, I'm, the only variable I'm looking at is time. So these are all broadcast at about 1.02 or 1.03 Satoshis per byte. So right near the minimum fee level. Okay, so now let's all move on to experiment number two, the minor bribe attack. So the minor bribe attack starts the same as the fast respend attack. Step number one and step number two are the same. But step number three is different. The attacker is less worried about getting the transaction out really quickly and more concerned with attaching a bribe in the form of a higher transaction fee to try to persuade the miners to, even if they see the green transaction first, to replace that green transaction with the red transaction. From the mining perspective, it might look like this. So they might all be working on the green transaction already. When that first miner there sees the red transaction, he's got to ask himself, you know, should I replace the green transaction with the red transaction in order to earn more fees? This miner might say yes, but the other miners uh, wanting to preserve the, the value of the network, they're more ethical, they all say no. But even if one miner says yes, it's still a problem because assuming these miners all have equal hash power, there's now a 25% chance that the double spend succeeds. Okay, so the first thing I noticed when I tried to carry out these minor bribe attacks was how do I actually make the miners aware that I'm willing to you know, pay them extra money if they'll help me commit fraud? And, and if you look on social media, people say, oh yeah, you just, you know, you just send the transaction to the miner with a higher fee and they replace the legitimate transaction with your fee. Okay, so I Googled around looking for like double spend services offered by miners, didn't find any. <laughs> <laughs> I looked for IP addresses so I could connect my node directly to the miners, again, didn't find any. And I realized that it's actually pretty hard to even make the miners aware of your bribe transaction. Okay? So, what I did as step number one is to basically repeat uh, my experiment from experiment number one, except always the, 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 the fraudulent transaction is broadcast with a 0.5 second delay, but now I'm attaching a higher fee to it. So I'm using just a small 0.5 second delay because then I know that both those transactions have a pretty good chance of, of propagating through the network and, and maybe getting picked up. And I know from experiment number one, if uh, if, if the two fee levels are the same, I expect the double spend to succeed about 23 or 24% of the time. Okay, so, so what did I find when I attached a 10 Satoshi per byte fee? So that's 10 times the fee rate, so it's like a 10 times bribe to the miner. So of the 868 attempts I made, I had 209 successes for a 24.1% success rate. So about the same as what I got without attaching a bribe. But I didn't want to purely compare those numbers to my previous experiment. So I also ran a control group at the same time. So basically, when I'm running my experiment, for every pair of transactions I'm trying to double spend with this minor bribe attack, I also create a control set of double spends that, have, that both have a fee of one Satoshi per byte. So everything is the same about those two sets of transactions, except for the fee rate. And that allows me to get like a real apples to apples compa comparison to isolate for purely the effect of the bribe. So my control group here had uh, you know, slightly less successes for about a 23.1% success rate. So there's about a 1% difference in the success rate. If you do the math on this, that's not a statistically significant difference. You'd expect with that sample size to have a 1% difference around half the time. So 
we can't reject the null hypothesis. It appears that Tan Satoshi's per byte does not change the probability that your transaction is confirmed. So I asked myself, well, maybe I'm just not making the feed juicy enough to, <laughs> to entice the miners. So I repeated that experiment with a 100 Satoshi per byte fee and the same 0.5 second delay. Again, my control group, you know, still had 23.7% success rate, you know, what we, what we expect. But now my bribe group went up to 28.7%. 28.7 minus 23.7 is five. And you expect a 5% difference by randomness, by dumb luck, only one in every thousand experiments. So now we have to think about rejecting the null hypothesis. It appears that the higher fee does make it more likely that the fraud succeeds. Okay, yes? How many blocks did you use? Did you have one that was spent at 10 per block? Or I had, I, I was broadcasting transactions every 30 seconds. So it'll, and, and this went over, you know, like six or eight or so, something hours. So many blocks? Yeah, there's several blocks and several transactions for, per block. Okay, so yeah, so that appears to be statistically significant. Okay. So then what I did is, okay, I, I wanna go to longer and longer delays. So I couldn't even get the transactions into the network. So what I did is on my Bitcoin and Limit nodes, I, I enabled the double spend relaying feature. Uh, previously I had that disabled. So I repeated the experiment with a 100 sat per byte bribe, one second delay, and now I see something even more interesting. So now I'm having a 17.5% success rate with the bribe, and my control group only has a 0.3% success rate. So that's definitely statistically significant. Then I went to a five second delay, and again I saw it, really interesting. The bribe attack succeeded 5.5% of the time, where my control group succeeded 0% of the time. So either, <laughs> I made some mistake that I, I don't understand in my methodology, or this is a real effect, and attaching a bribe does make it more likely to be confirmed. Yeah, yes? There's a more interesting question here, like what, you know, what are the miners that mine those bribes? <laughs> you can ask me after, after the talk. <laughs> so the miners aren't following for say. Yeah, that's, that's what it seems like to me, yeah. So, so what, what the interesting one is like the 10 seconds, uh, the 10 seconds per bite, do you repeat that as well? So like, as the noise, like, it looks like 5% of the miners are like, you know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and this kind of jives in what you were saying, uh, uh, that Daniel, so I think something is going on. Uh, it's funny because when I was originally doing my experiment, I, I briefly looked at the results for, for this category, and I kind of convinced myself, I, I didn't have all the results in, and I'm like, oh, it looks like there's no effect. Because I, I was biased, I thought there was, was no effect. So, but then it wasn't until I actually kind of more rigorously did it, that I, I'm like, hmm, that's something suspicious. So I, I did all this, and I'm like, yeah, something's going on. But like, a lot of this data was just from yesterday and the day before, so I haven't had time to explore out further. Yes? Um, for the one, one Satoshi per byte uh, attacks, was there, was there any obvious cases where it's not, this is like not confirmed next block? Because there might be miners that simply have some higher minimum fee. Right? I didn't measure that, but just from, from my peripheral glances, it looked like they were always be confirmed the next block, but I, I couldn't say that was 100% true. Um, okay, so I'm probably going to go a little bit over time because there's been, been, been a bit of questions. Um, but, but, uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, <laughs> let's continue. Okay, so I think you say attaching a fee of 100 Satoshi fight does increase the probability that, of succeeding in a double spend attempt in some cases. Okay, last experiment, the reverse respend attack. This is different than the first two because step number one involves the black hat broadcasting the fraudulent transaction that sends the coins back to his own wallet. So like Andrea said, he broadcasts a non-standard transaction that he knows is gonna relay poorly and only be attempted to be mined in blocks by a small subset of the miners. Uh, so then when he goes to, I'm sorry, when he goes to pay the barista in step two, she, you know, sees the green transaction. She doesn't know about the red transaction because the red transaction doesn't pr propagate. So she accepts it as valid payment. She gives him the coffee. And now he just sits back, drinks his coffee, and hopes that one of the miners that picked up that red transaction happens to find the next block. From the miner's perspective, so when he sends that red transaction, this miner might see it. That miner might say, this transaction is not standard. I don't want it. The other miners at the bottom, this guy says no. 
This guy says no as well. But this guy, he says, I support permissionless innovation. <laughs> I want to confirm these weird transactions. So, because that could lead to cool things, which I think is a valid point. So he says, yes, I'm, I'm gonna accept that transaction. But now, when our black hat pays the legitimate fee, or the legitimate transaction to the merchant, now these three miners, this looks perfectly good. So they all accept that green transaction, but to the miner at the top, that looks like a double spend. So he says no. So now we have this case where that miner, because he's trying to support permissionless innovation, he's unknowingly aiding our black hat in carrying out a double spend attack on the merchant. So again, if these guys have equal hash power, that'll succeed 25% of the time. Okay, so uh, wrapping up here. So I made 3,646 attempts. 406 were successes for about 11% success rate. And it's not at all a mystery what's going on in this case. Basically, every successful double spend occurred when Bitcoin.com, mining with Bitcoin Unlimited, found a block. And the reason for that is there's just different fee policies between BU nodes and ABC nodes, as Andreas pointed out. And my attack was uh, the Jason C attack from Twitter, basically. My non-standard transaction is like 0.98 Satoshis per byte. My standard transaction is like 1.02 Satoshis per byte. And that's how I, I gained the system. Okay, so summary. The fast respend attacks were surprisingly difficult to perform. The fraud TX must be broadcast within about 0.5 seconds to have 10% success probability, which is not possible in many real world cases. Attaching a 100 sat per byte bribe in the form of a higher transaction fee increased the probability that a double spend was mined, but only in certain scenarios. And lastly, reverse respend attacks were the most effective way to double spend unconfirmed transactions. Thank you. I just have a question for the first experiment, because you said, okay, then I put up a lot of nodes um, as the attacker in order to propagate that fast, uh, faster. Yeah. But isn't that something that you need to do only once in order to figure out where the miners are? Because in the end, you, you want to push one transaction to the miner and at the same time one transaction to the merchant and then hope that they don't cross each other fast enough, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So yeah. it's not like you need to a lot of nodes there. No, that, that's a good point. And uh, I, I thought about, you know, maybe I could do some pre-experiments to try to find the fastest path to the miners, but I didn't. I just thought, okay, I'll just brute force it with, with lots of nodes. But yeah, I think you could probably even do better than that if you, if you really study the propagation paths. Okay, yeah. Um, what was the total cost uh, of this? Is it like feasible to run these periodically or is it, uh, did it cost a lot of money? I, I haven't tabulated that, yeah. uh, but I, I don't think it was too much because most of, most of it can be done with one Satoshi per byte uh, fees. It's only when I'm, it's the bigger bribes that, that add up, right? But they're, they're less likely to convert. But I think I spent maybe a, a couple hundred dollars doing this experiment. It was, okay. it was definitely less than a thousand. Not bad. Okay. Um, I guess the only other thing was I, was I was just thinking of, you know, explanations for the, the minor bribe in light of my previous comment. Um, you know, I think this is part of our challenge is, you know, where Bitcoin Cash is like a minority network and you have some core, you know, core has basically said our social contract says mining double spends is encouraged and, you know, we're not even going to attempt these zero comp. So there may be a good number of miners who might flip over to mining Bitcoin Cash just for a little side extra money mm -hmm. during the brief period where it's more profitable to mine Bitcoin Cash but they consider Bitcoin as like their main business. And for them, they might just switch over their mining pool software to mine Bitcoin Cash and not change the, you know, the rules that they're mining with in the pool. And for them, the, the, the benefits of changing the rules to, to you know, cater to the Bitcoin Cash network is not worth the cost to them to reconfigure all their mining software. That's one possible explanation. Mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't know, but if anyone else has, has opinions. But I think that being a minority network compared to another network that doesn't care about zero comp certainly doesn't work to our, our advantage in that case. I think another possible uh, explanation is that um, the APC software, I believe, inherited some code from Core where they like um, have a dynamic uh, mempool acceptance fee. 
So if, if at some point the mempool was filled up, like during the stress test, mm. they would like uh, increase the minimum fee to be accepted into the mempool. So well, that's really interesting. Yeah, because because the uh, the other one was like 1.02 satoshi per byte. So maybe that just got pushed under or something. So this is technically true, but even during the stress test, we didn't show mempool big enough so that it would be a significant uh, factor there. Uh, by default, the mempool is a few hundred meg, but what we saw is that the, the limiting factor during the stress test was how fast we can relay transaction, and actually we saw a fair bit of mempool desynchronization between various nodes because they couldn't send transaction fast enough to each other, so we don't see the mempool fill up to the kind of number that would you know, screw everything up. I have a question on your fee slide. Uh, why, do you, why do you think the successful respans in the control group dropped so significantly to zero? Oh, just because I had increased the time, so that was expected. In the feed experiment? Yeah. So. Oh, okay, you also, okay. Yeah, so, so yeah, I wanted to, because these, these were giving me no, no successes when I had double spend relaying off. Right, so, so, got it. So this, this, this experiment was with double spend relaying off, and then here I had to turn it on to, you know, to make sure that these double spans are whizzing around the network. Okay, and you mentioned that for the last two experiments you had turned on double spend relay, but the first two it wasn't? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's so, a different so, factor so, also? Right, so every experiment I did, my BU nodes had double spend relaying off, except for these last two where I had the bigger bribes and the longer delays. And that was necessary to even get the transactions into the network. Okay, but do you have a theory about how a miner, oh, because it was a BU miner, and he would, would have seen both? I have no, I, I don't know, this is, this is, right. this is a mystery okay, to me. Because we're not aware of any miner that receives both and then makes a decision. But yeah, I, I'm I, inferring I, that, yeah, that from the results. I have one other question um, or comment. Be aware the old piece of those miners <laughs> uh, you mentioned oh, with the 100 KB TX yeah. uh, that uh, it wasn't a real concern because a merchant would probably be, be unlikely to treat a 100 KB TX as legitimate even though it's standard mm -hmm. and I just want to point out that to me that's imposing that is, an, that is creating another class of transactions where you would say well people aren't going to expect any standard transaction to be reliable. They'll only expect a smaller than standard transaction to be reliable. And that is one of the concepts behind the SI idea. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks very much, Piers. Very, very insightful. Uh, did you do, I don't think you did, but as far as the, the fee size ratio of the, the first uh, transaction, you just kept it as at one, one Satoshi per byte? You, yes. never, you never tested with, because comparatively that's relatively low. Com I'm saying, just what, comparing to what's, uh, what's the average of what's accepted into a block. I think it would be very insightful to see if you have the same success if you were to increase the actual, um, the, the, the good transaction, let's say. The first yeah. transaction, if you were to, if you were to test, if you were to do five, five right. Satoshi, whatever, because that would be, um, let's say the medium of what transactions are. It's something, it's something that we we find is actually much more important oh, as 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 the you know what is the fee size ratio that a transaction is using not not in its uh, number but actually in compared to what what you know what the fee size ratio of transactions have been in the past six blocks or yeah. something like that and that and that uh, I think that'll significantly lower the success. Okay. But I mean, I'd, be, I'd be very interested to see. Yeah, I think that, that makes a lot of sense to try that. Um, you know, I, 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 I kind of you know, did this, put, put it together you know, fairly quickly, and I think it was still quite useful. But now that I've done it, I, I think it would be great to, you know, to test the variables much more, much more widely, like really look at a you know, whole range of fee rates, a whole range of time, time delays, and instead of spending a couple hundred dollars, spend like several thousand dollars and run this for like a week and then really get a feel for, like to really map out what's happening on the network in terms of double spend fraud. Yeah, um, I think the percentages of double spend are really interesting here. Um, 
especially the outlier of 17.5%. And so I was thinking, uh, first of all, if your hypothesis is that some miner is not um, respecting first seen safe, then um, the first issue is that instead of having 800 samples, you really only have about 40 samples because it's um, each block that gets yeah. mined, right? Yeah. So I'd be interested in seeing the calculations of is that difference statistically significant given um, you know, a sample size of 40? And then also, given that we, if it is, given that we have this outlier, we could look at the blocks in the origination to perhaps determine which miner isn't respecting first scene safe, mm -hmm. right? So it would be great to take a look at this data a little bit closer. Yes, I, I, I agree. Yes, yeah, so Peter, first of all, thank you. It was a very interesting talk uh, with, with these figures there. Um, I just want to comment on what uh, Tom Harding said, that like a 100 k wide transaction would be like a new transaction then. I think I would see it differently. I think it's more like a, as you say, like we, we map out the space here. And, uh, and also, I mean, like a, as a general comment, like you're talking about probability of a double spend given that, uh, that the customer is already an attacker, right? And you have to also factor in that the attacker is probably like a 5% of yeah. the customers, right? So, uh, yeah, it looks to me like uh, this could be extended or like the, 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 like the perfect uh, final uh, result of what you do here would be like a model, basically, like a statistical model where you have like, okay, this is the condition of the network and this is how likely this transaction is going to be a double spend, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I'd love to, to do that over the next next months and try try to try to map that out. And I think even the act of mapping it and making that information public might make the miners wise up because they, they know we're onto them. So we have time for one more question. Yeah, so I'd like to rebound on this and maybe we can have your thought to you know about it. Um, I think you're absolutely correct that. Um, this kind of model is what you want to use as a business to know if you want to accept zero confirm not and, and what kind of risk you are taking. Um, however, as protocol designer, we want to go at it from the fundamentals because we must not expect that those numbers are going to stay the same, especially if there is a way to systematize that. We may see those numbers change dramatically in the future. So. Um, um, those numbers are very, like you know, those numbers are, are more interested for businesses, but maybe not um, um, for us. Like in terms of coming up with solution, we want to actually plug the holes. Even like we don't want to wait for those numbers to become big before plugging those holes. Cool. Thank you very much for that presentation. So we'll